And um, what we talked about was that even though this is not factorable by grouping, so when I discovered that, actually I already knew it, I marked through it and, and said not factorable. Well, up until yesterday, it was not factorable. But we then discovered that all polynomials are factorable. Ooh. Okay. So then we proceeded to go through a new method of factoring polynomials. And that is to look for the rational zeros first. Rational zeros are, are whole integers like one, two, and three, or negative one, negative two, negative three, even zero, or fractions. We don't love fractions, but we're they're better, right? They're better than square roots, cube roots, fourth roots, fifth roots, the irrational numbers. So these are okay, we'll settle for those. The main reason is that we can actually find them on the x-axis. It's really hard to find the square root of seven on the x-axis. It is there, but you can only approximate where it is. All right, so the first thing we would like to find is get the rational zeros, and that's what we did. We found out that if we use P over Q, we can find the rational zeros if they're there. So what P is, P is, P is the factors of the constant in the very last place of a polynomial that's written correctly in descending order. See, you have degree three, degree two, degree one, and constants are always called degree zero. Well, when you factor that, you get everything that's in P. And we discovered that when we factor 24, it doesn't matter whether it's negative 24 or positive 24, because we're going to take both, we discovered that the factors of 24 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24. They're not, oh, they are eight. That's right. Okay, so these are the factors of 24, and then we put little, little um, um, set braces around them and put a plus or minus in front in order to let everybody know, yeah, 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 okay. Really, we're dealing with the positive and negative. So then the Q, the Q consists of the factors of the leading coefficient here. But that's just a one right now for this problem. And so when we take all of our P's, put them over all our Q's, that gives us a big pool of all the possible rational zeros, the nice zeros of the function. Um, and here, since we're just putting it over one, basically, we have discovered that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight positive and eight negative possible rational zeros with the understanding that there is not a guarantee that you're going to find any rational zeros, which can be a little frustrating sometimes, more than a little frustrating. It's happened to me, it could happen to you. And then we have to turn to our computers. But more of that in another class. So what we did after we had our collection of possible rational zeros, 
we went to the graph and then we looked at we tried to find numbers in here that are x-intercepts or zeros if you prefer here remembering that the zeros are the x-coordinates of the x-intercepts uh, yeah they're the x-coordinates of the x-intercepts so one negative four and negative six composed our hypothesis of what the zeros were. And then we had to check and make sure that these really were the zeros. Now, if one is a zero, if negative four is a zero of this polynomial, and if negative six is a zero, then when we put those numbers in for the X, we will get a zero. And indeed, these numbers gave us a zero, which means that the zeros of this f of x are 1, negative 4, and negative 6. And just to help you remember, that means that our x-intercepts, because there's a very close relationship, let me write this first, between real zeros and x-intercepts. Remember, real means in the real number system on the x-axis and on the y-axis. Okay, so however, with these, we're just talking about the x-axis. All right, so one zero is going to be the x-intercept made from this zero. Negative four zero is the x-intercept made from that zero. And negative six zero is the x-intercept made from this zero. And we proved all that just by taking these three numbers, putting them in for the x's, substituting, and finding out that the answer we get is zero. That's what a zero is makes f of x equal zero. And then using the factor formula, let me write factor formula, we could use the zeros to get the factors of this function. And then we discover that in spite of the fact that this was not factorable at all, we have nice rational zeros. If we say X minus the first zero, which I made one, I mean, it doesn't matter. You just sort of make that decision as you go along doesn't matter which ones you put first and which ones you put second, which one you make Z2. I let this be Z1, 0, 1. And this be 0, 2. And this be 0, 3. And this is the factorization because A, the leading coefficient is one, we're done. There's the factorization of this. And if we multiply these factors together, we will get this. And that's the way that the zeros of a function actually build a polynomial. The zeros of the polynomial build the polynomial. You start with the zeros. You get the factors from the zeros. You multiply the factors together, you get the polynomial. So you can either go from the polynomial to the zeros, or you can go from the zeros to the polynomials. And this little formula here is what makes it all possible.
And then we did another one yesterday. Same kind of problem. This, using methods that you had not learned before yesterday, you couldn't factor this. But then using P over Q, you found all the possible rational zeros. Then you had to check and make sure they really were zeros. I mean, this may look like negative one, but how do you know it's not negative 1.001? .001? You don't know. So you really have to check and make sure that the numbers you think are the zeros are the zeros. In grown-up math, you can't guess. You can't assume. Wait till you take trigonometry. I learned the hard way, never assume. Okay, so the same thing happened here. We found a, a, pot, a pot of gold, if you will. Yes, the phone going on um, 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 airplane mode. I forgot. There you go. Okay. You know how you're supposed to be able to take your phone, turn it upside down, right? And put it down on the desk and it, it won't come on. Doesn't work for me. That's what I get for getting a cheap phone. But I don't regret it. My phone is a lot cheaper than your phone. I can guarantee it. And it's still a smartphone. Anyway, we did, we went through this whole process again. We tested the numbers that are in here that were also in here. And then we checked and made sure they're really zeros. And then we followed the instructions, which were factor the polynomial. Once you have the zeros, you can factor. Okay, now, moving on. We have a doozy. Let me write it much larger. F of X equals X to the third. So let me write a one here. X to the third minus 17 X squared plus 55 X plus 25. And of course, I would assume, and uh, yeah, I would assume I could factor this by grouping, but when I try, the same thing happens as yesterday. Okay, I can factor out a common factor here. And I can factor out a common factor here. But then this and this don't match. So that means, nope, grouping is not going to work. Nope, nope, nope. And it's a cubic. If this were quadratic, I could use the quadratic formula, which I will not sing to you today, but you are capable of singing it to yourself and to your children. which lets them share in your experience if you have children or little brothers and sisters. All right, so my, my P 
is going to be all the factors of 25. And my Q is going to be all the factors of one. Now, are we going to graduate to a leading coefficient that is not a one? Yes. But let's take baby steps at first. Okay. So P is going to equal plus or minus one times 25 and five times five. So that would just be a five. So let's just do this the easy way. Or not. One, five, and 25. And then Q, of course, is going to be the set of all the factors of one all the integer factors of one, which are plus or minus one. Then, now you would be doing this in your head, really. But I just want to make very clear what the steps are. P over Q is going to give us one, five, and 25 all over one. With the plus or minus out there, it becomes easy, right? Which means you can pretty well discount the Q in this case when it's a one. One, five, and 25. And, you know, it's just so easy to go ahead and write it as plus or minus one plus or minus five, and plus or minus 25. Now I shared yesterday that in the old days, before there were graphing calculators, people had to test every single one of the P over Q group to see if any of them were really rational zeros. And there were a few other rules you could learn to cut down on the number that we don't deal with now because it's just so easy to take x to the third minus 7x squared plus 55x plus 25 and throw this lovely thing into the calculator and take a look. and estimate like we did yesterday. So X caret three minus 17 X squared plus 55 X plus 25. Okay, there's a 25 over here. So X to the third minus 17X squared plus 55X. And let, yeah, well, yeah. Let's go over there and make really, really sure that I typed plus 25 and I did. Okay, let's graph it. Mm-hmm. Now, I know there are going to be three zeros. They might not all be rational, but okay, I need to expand my x-axis. Oh yeah, of course, all the way out to negative 25 and positive 25. This can be a pain, but it's something you have to do. So negative 25, Nah, better make it negative 30. Why? Because if negative 25 or positive 25 were a zero and the screen ended there, I might not be able to actually see the graph cutting the x-axis 
at negative 25 or positive 25. So I'm going to change to negative 30 and positive 30. There it is. Of course, now you can't see that one, but at least I know it's there. That's the important thing. Now I can start adjusting Hmm. OK, I'm going to adjust again. That's as good as we can get. Now notice that. I'm going to put it on here and make it really big. All right. Here's the graph. And yeah, here it is. It's coming up, 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 cutting the x-axis here, going up, coming down, cutting the x-axis here, and going down, turning around, coming up, cutting the x-axis. Here, how do I know it's doing that? Because of it, ooh, because of end behavior. This is a cubic with a positive leading term. That means the end behavior is going to be up on the right and down on the left. So there's no choice. This has got to be going down on the left and then up on the right, which means this is going like that. Now, notice that this zero occurs between x equals zero and x equals one, which means at best it's a fraction. I can't guess it. The same thing here, this is between whatever two numbers those are. But this, this looks like it could be positive one, two, three, four, five. Am I absolutely certain? No. But I'm, I, that's going to be my hypothesis, my educated guess, that five could be a zero of the function. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to have f of x. Let me get back here. Hmm. OK. little blurry. That's better. OK, I'm going to put 5 in for every x. And see if f of x equals 0. So f of 5. That's the code for put a 5 in. For every x 5 to the third minus 17 times 5 squared plus 55 times 5 
plus 25. I don't know how that could be true, but let's see. 5 carat 3, come down, minus 17 times 5. As long as 5 is a positive number, I don't really have to put it in parentheses. Writing it this way is just a habit for me. Plus 55 times 5 plus 25. Ah, uh, I forgot to square the 5. All right. Not the worst thing I could do. I want the square to go right there, so I'm going to hit second delete and that'll give me insert and I'll hit X squared and then come on to the end. Yes, it's zero. Woo! What does that mean? What that means is and this is a blast to the future, okay? Um, what we're going to do is this. Now that I know that five is really, truly a zero of f of x, here's what I'm going to do. If five is a zero, I can let that be z1. And so the factor I would make from that would be X minus five. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make another page. And we're going to do something you don't have to do very often. I am going to move this back up so I can look at it. I'm going there. I'm going to take the factor x minus 5 that I made from the 0, 5, because now I know 5 is a 0. And I am going to divide it into x to the third minus 17x squared plus 55x plus 25. OK, now you may have learned this. In beginning algebra or you may not have not everybody teaches it, but we're going to do it now. The way you do it, it's not hard at all. It's just bothersome. I ask myself. How many times do I have to multiply this X in order to get X squared? And the uh, X to the cu X cubed, and the answer is X squared. OK, so if I multiply X by X squared, I'll get X cubed. That's precisely what I want. I'm going to write it here above the other x squared. Then I'm going to multiply. x squared times x is x cubed. And x squared times minus five 
is minus 5x squared. And then I'm going to take this little polynomial and subtract it from these two terms. Now, when I distribute the minus, I will get a minus there and a plus there. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring that over here. If I subtract x minus 5 and distribute the minus sign, I will get, well, minus x to the third, I'm sorry, minus 5x squared. I will get minus x cubed, and then minus times minus is plus 5x squared. So that's what this is going to become because I'm subtracting it. Minus x cubed and plus 5x squared. Now x to the third minus x to the third <clears throat> is zero. Negative 17x squared plus 5x squared is negative 12x squared. See, this is just like doing long division with numbers. Nobody loves doing long division with numbers, but it's not undoable. And then next week on Wednesday, you're going to learn a quicker method. So don't get all worried about this. Zero minus 12 X squared is negative 12 X squared. Now I ask myself self, what do I multiply that X by in order to get negative 12 X squared? This thing right here. And the answer is, well, if I take this and I multiply by negative 12x, I'll get negative 12x squared. OK, so I'll make that minus 12x squared. And then I'll take this minus, which is also a negative, negative 12x squared and multiply it by x. So I get. No, 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 that's going to be an x. There you go. Haven't done this in a few years. Negative 12x times x is negative 12x squared. Okay, I'm going to come over here and write it. And now I can't leave this out. I can't leave the minus 5 out. Negative 12x times 5 is times negative 5 is going to be positive 60 X I think but I'm going to pull out the calculator and make sure 5 times 12 60 okay so when I take negative 12 X to the 1 power and multiply it by x, I get negative 12x squared. And when I take negative 12x and multiply it by negative 5, I get plus 60x. Perfect. Now, something I neglected to do was what we have to do when you do long division with numbers is you bring down the next term. And then I'm going to subtract negative 12x squared plus 60x. And that will give me positive 12x squared or plus 12x squared minus 
x. So plus 12x squared minus 60x. And this is what happens. Negative 12x squared plus 12x squared is zero. 55x minus 60x is negative 5x. And then I bring down the next term, 25. Now, one more time, only one more time, because that's the very last term to bring down. Take x and ask myself, self, what do I multiply x by in order to get negative 5x? And the answer would be negative 5. So minus 5. Take that minus 5 times x, is negative 5x, and minus 5 times minus 5 is plus 25. And then I'm going to subtract, which is what you always do when you do long division. Negative times negative is positive. Negative times positive is negative. And so we write that up here. Positive 5x, negative 25. And look what happens. I get a 0 and a 0. I knew that would have to happen. Why? Because 5 is a 0. So the factor I make from that has to go evenly into this polynomial. And now this is what's left over. And what do I know from this? I know this. Let me write that down there before I scroll up. I've got, I have just found out that f of x equals x to the third minus 17x squared plus 55x plus 25 equals x minus 5 times x squared minus 12x minus 5. Let me put a box, kind of a box, around that. Now I can scroll up. There. I have factored this into this. But I need to factor this, and that's not factorable. There are no factors of negative 5 that are going to add up to negative 12, but it is a quadratic. So now I can use my buddy, the quadratic formula, where A is 1, B is negative 12, and C is negative 5. Now, do you want me to sing to you? Probably you don't. So, X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 
that goes all the way out to the negative sign here in front of the B, all over 2A. And B is negative, so you're going to have to put it in parentheses. So we'll have negative, negative 12, plus or minus the square root of negative 12 squared minus four times one times negative five all over two times one. Now all I have to do is work this out. Negative times negative 12 is positive 12 plus or minus the square root of 144, positive 144. Negative 12 times negative 12 is positive 144. That's why you have to put it in parentheses if you're using your calculator. All right, now, negative four times one is negative four, or minus four times negative five is plus 20. All over two. We're almost there. So this is X equals, X equals 12 plus or minus the square root of 164. I always make it too wrong, too long. That's why I want to try to start doing this. And then when I write whatever I'm going to write, then I'll bring this out. Not that it's a big deal. Over two. Okay, now something we're going to have to do. This would get you partial credit. But let's go for the gold. I'm going to factor 164. Let's get the calculator. One sixty four. Let's see. Divided by two. No, let's divide by four. Let's go for it. One six four divided by four. Ha! It worked. One sixty four divided by four is forty one. So one sixty four. The square root of 164 equals the square root of 4 times 41. I want to make absolutely sure that I did this correctly. So let's go back up here and do this the way you would do it. Parentheses, negative 12, parentheses closed, squared, minus four times one times negative five. Yep, times negative five. Enter. It is 164. Okay, just feeling a little insecure. Never trust yourself too much. So the square root of 164 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 41. So it's going to be 2 times the square root of 41. This is something you have to do. So we're going to have 12 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 41 over 2, and we're not done. B 
because there is a common factor of two up here. X equals two parentheses six plus or minus the square root of 41 over two. Now remember 12 is two times six and this is two times that. So there is a common factor of two, a greatest common factor, a GCF. Now I have to do this because I need to be able to do this. Your answers need to be in very, very, very lowest terms. Just like with fractions, and it is a kind of a fraction. So now here's your answer, x equals six plus or minus the square root of 41. Ha! Huh. So now we have our zeros. What were we even trying to do here? Yes, factor. <laughs> All this is so we can factor this sucker right here. All right, so. Z1, if you recall, is 5. Z2 is 6 minus the square root of 41. And Z3 is 6 plus the square root of 41. That's the reason You would never have been able to guess that or guess that. This is six minus the square root of 41. This is six plus the square root of 41. Okay, now I'm going to factor. And I do this with the factor formula. A times x minus z1 times x minus z2 times x minus z3. And a is one, which means for all intents and purposes, it's just going to become invisible. Now, we are going to have x minus 5 times x minus 6 minus the square root of 41, close bracket, bracket, x minus parentheses 6 plus the square root of 41, close parenthesis, close bracket. This is our factorization right now. Now I'm going to distribute the minus sign because I certainly don't want to have to have brackets. I mean, that, that sucks. So, f of x, when you factor it, is going to be x minus 5, that's the factor made from our one rational zero. X minus six plus the square root of 41 times X minus six minus the square root of 41. And that's real college algebra math. That's what we're going to be doing on Wednesday and Thursday. I'm not going to make anything new on Monday or Tuesday, 
because you're having your exam. So on Monday, on Monday and Tuesday during class time, we will just have a question period. How do you do this on the practice exam? I couldn't figure it out. How do you do this on the practice exam? And then on Wednesday, we start this. But there is a less difficult way to do this. Although if you've done it before, you know it's not really that difficult. However, there is a shorter way and we're going to do it. So that's what we'll do Wednesday and then Thursday. Ah, there's not going to be any end to the factoring. OK, now. We're going to move on. Let's see, we did this. Yes. Yesterday, we also said, OK, if you're given a bunch of zeros, how do you build your polynomial? And that's what we did here x plus 2 times x minus 3 times the x plus 4. Multiply them all together to get the polynomial. And here we have the first zero is 2, the second zero is 5i, the third zero is negative 5i, so we have complex conjugates here. Multiply them all together and you get this that's not terribly scary looking at all. And now we could do this, but I want to show you something first that's easy. Sort of bring your morale back up. Looks difficult. It's not. Suppose a polynomial of degree four, that means it can have four zeros. And four X intercepts from those zeros if the zeros are real. All right, suppose the polynomial of degree four with rational coefficients, that is nice numbers, okay, nice numbers has the given numbers as zeros, these. This is not nice, but this is nice and that's nice. Find the other zero. This could be so difficult, but it's not. First, let's find the rational zeros. The rational zeros. are negative three and seven fifths. So the factors you would make from those are X minus negative three, which will give you X plus three, and X minus seven fifths. And for now, we're gonna leave it that way. Then there's this. That is not a rational number. That is an irrational zero. The square root of five. You'll still have a factor from it though, the factor from this will be x minus the square root of 5. But when you, you're told that the coefficients of all the x's 
are rational, like this and that, that means that the conjugate of this is also going to be a zero. So negative the square root of five will also be a zero. Now that's all they're asking. This is degree four, it's got to have four zeros. We're given three, something is wrong. Well, negative three and seven fifths are rational, but with rational coefficients, if I have one square root, I'm going to have its conjugate. And so this is the answer. This is the only answer. Negative the square root of five. That's all you have to do is write that in the answer box. You don't have to do anything scary with it. Okay, now we have a degree four polynomial. It's got to have four zeros. Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. It's got rational coefficients. That is, in this fourth degree polynomial, the numbers in there are all rational numbers like that and that, like these two. Nice numbers, nicer numbers. Here we don't have that at all. This is a complex number and this is an irrational number. Well, if you've got rational coefficients, and rational coefficients are also real coefficients, then each of these is going to be accompanied by their conjugate. So if Z1 is five plus four I, then it's conjugate five minus four I will also be a zero. And if four plus the square root of two is a zero, then four minus the square root of two is also going to be a zero. I should have said if this is a zero, then it's conjugate. This will also be a zero. So you're given these two zeros. It says, all it says is find the other zeros. So in the answer box, you're going to put five minus four I up. No. lowercase i. 5 minus 4i and 4 minus the square root of 2, and that will be what you type in the answer box, and you'll be told, good job. Irrational numbers and complex numbers are always accompanied by their conjugates when the numbers in front of the x's, let's go back up here and look, like this. There's a 1, a negative 17, a 55, and a 25. Those are rational coefficients. When you have rational coefficients, 
like these, it's guaranteed that irrational numbers will always be accompanied by their conjugates. So this is accompanied by that, and this is accompanied by that. Gotta happen. Now here we have a couple of more problems that are just like that. But we can just zoom through them now. Here you have a complex number. Here you have an irrational number. The, um, um, the conjugate of I is negative I. The conjugate of six minus the square root of seven is six plus the square root of seven. That's all you have to type in the answer box. And, oh my goodness, a degree five polynomial. There have to be five zeros. Well, my goodness, this is rational. That's a good one. This is irrational, so it will be accompanied by its conjugate. This is complex, so it will be accompanied by its conjugate, positive to I. That's all there is to it. You write these two numbers in the answer box, not all five. Well, see, now you do have five zeros, though. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, this is a rational number. This is a rational number. Zero and negative eight. They're rational. This is irrational. No, it's not. It's complex. Complex, let's just say comp. Oh no, let's not. That's complex. Now what does this say? Degree four, it's gotta have four zeros. These are, there are three here. We have to find the other one. Here's a complex zero. It's going to be accompanied by its conjugate. So that's all you have to write in the answer box. And, excuse me, oh, that's it for those. Now we're back to this. This is, I'm not going to say difficult because it's doable. But it's one of those problems where you have to be very, very careful. Okay. I need to find the polynomial of lowest degree with only real coefficients, they should have said rational, and having these zeros, five plus the square root of seven, five minus the square root of seven, and four. And there's an assumption that A is one. We're gonna go ahead and assume that for this. It should say so, it doesn't, but it's their mistake. The answer always ends up with A is one. In this book. 
Okay, how do I get the polynomial? I use, well, I can make that blue. F of X equals one times X minus Z one times X minus Z two. I should have said A, A times X minus Z one times X minus Z two times X minus Z three. So we're going to have F of X equals This is one times that. Times X minus. Five plus the square root of seven. Times X minus five minus the square root of seven. All right. So F of X equals, I can let the one disappear. X minus four times X minus five minus the square root of seven. X minus five plus, cause minus times minus is plus, the square root of seven. Okay, now, there is a special way to do this that makes life a lot easier on you. And on me. F of X equals X minus four. I put X minus four in front because it's just going to be repeated a good deal. It's not going to do anything for a while. Now, I want you to notice something. And in fact, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to brackets. I'm going to write the X minus five as X minus five. But blue. Minus the square root of seven. bracket X minus five plus the square root of seven. Now the reason I put brackets is I'm about to insert parentheses. The X minus five and the X minus five are just alike. The square root of seven and the square root of seven, they're just alike. The only difference between this and this is that they have opposite signs in the middle. You can sort of look, look at these like, let's come over here. A minus B 
times A plus B. Those are conjugates. And when we multiply conjugates together, the following thing happens. A squared plus AB minus AB minus B squared. And look what happens to the middle terms. AB minus AB is zero. So you have A squared plus zero minus b squared, which gives you a squared minus b squared. So when you multiply conjugates, what you get is the first term squared minus the second term squared. Now that's already written down here, so I'm going to erase it up here just so I'll have more room. But keep that in mind. Because that's precisely what we are going to do to these. We're going to let this equal A and the square root of seven equal B. And the only difference between them is the sign in the middle. So I know the following. This is so cool. What could have been a very difficult multiplication has just become a much easier multiplication. This is x minus five in parentheses squared minus the square root of seven squared. Well, my goodness. X minus five times X minus five is X squared minus five X minus five X plus 25. So this is going to be x squared minus 10x plus 25. And this is going to be minus 7. Because when you square a square root, the square and the square root cancel each other out and you're left with the radicand, the thing under the radical. Meanwhile, these guys are over here kind of twiddling their thumbs. We're, we're gonna bring them back in in just a minute. All right, all right. We're going to have x minus 4 times x squared minus 10x plus 18. Is that right? 25 minus 7 is 18. We could do this.
I'm going to take this X. Multiply it by what's in the parentheses there. X squared minus 10 X plus 18. And then take the minus four. X squared minus 10 X plus 18. Now I distribute, I combine like terms, and I'm done. f of x equals x cubed minus 10x squared plus 18x minus 4x squared plus 40x minus 4 times 8 is 32 minus 72 I think, let's make sure. Negative four times positive 18. Yeah, okay. So now all I have to do is combine my like terms and I have the polynomial that is built from these three zeros. So x to the third minus 10x squared minus 4x squared is minus 14x squared plus 18x plus 40x is plus 58x. Minus 72. Ta-da! I went five minutes over, but I am done. And you have learned a lot today. So now what you have to do is think about what we've done. And go get ready for the exam next week. Those two things. Bye-bye.